Hello, I'm Jade, and it's my life's ambition to find out the exact amount of time it takes for this ball to hit the ground when dropped from this bridge. Simon's down on the ground with a stopwatch to measure the time. He's programmed a special type of stopwatch. Rather than using seconds and microseconds, this one measures in fractions of a second, to 38 decimal places to be exact. All right, let's do it. All right, let's see what we got. Two point four four five zero six six two eight nine nine zero three two, etc., etc. Seconds. But is that the exact time? Of course, there's the human reaction time we need to take into account, just like with any measurement. There's also the processing speed of the computer. In reality, it's only accurate up to about three decimal places. But just imagine those things weren't a problem, and we did manage to capture the exact amount of time it took for the ball to reach the ground. This number still does not describe that exact amount of time. This is only up to 38 decimal places. For this to be the exact number, it would mean that everything after the 38th digit is followed by a bunch of zeros, which, as we'll see, is extremely unlikely. Much more likely is that the digits go on. I could get Simon to keep adding more and more digits, but that doesn't solve the problem. It makes it more accurate, but it will never be the exact number. When I say exact, this is what I mean. Take the number 0.3333333, where the threes repeat forever. We can't write this number exactly in decimal form because we can't write infinitely many threes. But when we write it as a fraction, suddenly it's possible. That's the exact number, and that's what I want. The exact number that describes the time it took for the ball to hit the ground. So can I convert my number to a fraction? Well, this begs the question, can all numbers be converted to fractions, a ratio of two integers? Numbers like this are called rational numbers, and it was thought for a long time that they could. Say you want to buy some wood, but only this much. What do you tell the cashier? It's more than one half, but less than three quarters. But luckily, we can cut it up into any number of equal parts that we want. So you can say, I'd like 13 out of the 25 segments, please. That's pretty handy. It means we can express complicated numbers like this by cutting a hole into lots of parts. You can cut a hole up into so many pieces that it seems possible to express any fraction of it as a rational number. But one day, this guy was discovered. The length of the hypotenuse of a triangle was side length one. Such a simple number. Yet try as they might, no one could express it in terms of a fraction of a whole number here the side is cut into 10 equal parts and the diagonal into 14 equal parts. But there is some small remainder. No matter how many equal segments they cut both lengths into, there was always some small remainder. And so it was discovered that some numbers are irrational. They just can't be expressed as a fraction. The digits of an irrational number never end and can't be written as a repeating pattern. Okay but maybe my number can still be converted into a fraction. Irrational numbers exist, but maybe I'll be lucky and mine will be rational. I mean, what are the odds that it's an irrational number? Well, actually, the odds are high, practically 100%. See, the rational and irrational numbers make up the real number line. The real number line is like a rubber band, only if rubber bands were infinitely long and infinitely stretchy infinitely long because it never ends. If we start counting, one, two, three, etc., we won't ever stop. The real number line extends to infinity in both the positive and negative directions. Infinitely stretchy because between any two numbers, there lies infinitely more numbers. Take the rational numbers one half and one. Integers are rational numbers because you can just put them over one. Between every pair of rational numbers, there is another rational number. You can zoom in forever and there will always be another rational number just waiting to be discovered. So between any two rational numbers, there are infinitely more rationals. Notice that you can't do this with the integers. Between any two integers, there is not another secret integer waiting. So you might think that there are more rational numbers than integers. That would be a reasonable thought, but wrong. You see, in math, we have a special way to see if we have the same amount of objects. If you have this many forks and this many spoons, 
and you can pair each fork with a spoon so that no forks or spoons are left over. We know that there are the same number of forks as spoons. If some forks are left over, you know that there are more forks than spoons. So two sets of objects are the same size if we can find a one-to-one -one pairing. If we cannot find a one-to-one -one pairing, one set of objects is bigger than the other. We can extend this idea to infinite sets. Take the set of all the natural numbers, the positive integers, and the set of all the rational numbers. At first, it seems impossible to make a one-to-one -one pairing. We'll just keep going down this rabbit hole and never getting to all the other rationals. But let's try arranging them like this. Make a table and write what the numerators will be along the top from one to infinity and what the denominators will be along the side. Now, fill the table. Here will be one over one, here will be one over two, here will be one over three, here will be two over one, here will be two over two. You get the idea. We will have some rationals that repeat like two over two, which is the same as one over one, but that doesn't really matter. We can just cross them out when we recognize them. If we try to pair the first row with a natural number, well, it goes off to infinity, so we'll never get to the second row. But a mathematician named Georg Cantor had the brilliant idea to count them diagonally. By doing it this way, you can pair each rational number with a natural number in a one-to-one -one correspondence. For any natural number you choose, you can systematically find the corresponding rational number. And remember, if you can place two sets of objects in a one-to-one -one pairing, those two sets of objects are the same size. Therefore, there are the same amount of rational numbers as natural numbers. And so, the first lesson about infinite sets. A subset of a set can be the same size as the whole set. This pairing with the natural numbers is basically counting, so we say that the rational numbers are countably infinite. So what about the irrational numbers? Is there a way to make a one-to-one -one pairing with them and the natural numbers? Well, Cantor showed that you can't. If we try the same trick as with the rational numbers, you can see why it won't work. Irrational numbers cannot be expressed as fractions, so the whole organizing them by numerator and denominator doesn't work. There is no systematic way to count them. Furthermore, Cantor found that the irrational numbers are more densely packed together than the rational numbers. Trying to count the irrationals is like trying to count the points on a line. There is always more line and there are always more irrationals. Because we cannot count the irrationals, the size of their infinity is called uncountably infinite. Cantor found that there are different sizes of infinity. Remember, if we can't make a one-to-one -one pairing between two sets, one set must be bigger than the other. And the uncountable infinity of the irrational numbers is vastly bigger than the countable infinity of the rational numbers. In fact, there are infinitely more irrational numbers than rational numbers. The rational numbers make up an infinitesimally small part of the real numbers. If we threw a dart onto the real number line, the chances that it would hit a rational number are so tiny that they are mathematically zero. So this number is most likely an irrational number. Bummer, that complicates things. I can't write it as a fraction, but mm, is there some other way to write its exact value? Can we even write irrational numbers as exact values? Well, look at the square root of two. That's irrational and we can write that as an exact value. Or what about this guy? This is a very famous irrational number, the golden ratio. It's pretty confusing that the golden ratio is irrational. But anyway, this number is expressed in terms of integers and mathematical operations. When we carry out these operations, we get the decimal expression of the golden ratio. We can't express the exact value in decimal form as the decimals go on forever, but we can express the exact value like this. I'd be happy with something like that. Can I convert my number into an arrangement of integers and mathematical operations? Well, how did we get this number? The golden ratio is the number you get when you divide a line into two parts so that the whole length divided by the long part is equal to the long part divided by the short part. If we make the short part one unit and the long part x, plug in the numbers to our strange line equation and rearrange a bit, we get the equation x squared minus x minus one is equal to zero. When we solve for x, we get one plus the square root of five over two. 
So this number is the solution to the equation that describes the golden ratio. Equations like these are called polynomial equations. The word polynomial just means many terms. Polynomial equations have integer coefficients and use all the tools of algebra, plus, minus, divide, multiply, and exponentiation. Numbers that are the solution to polynomial equations are called algebraic numbers because they are described and constructed by algebraic means. So it looks like building a polynomial equation and then finding its solution is a pretty nifty way to describe a number. But can all numbers be expressed in terms of algebraic operations and integers? The integer is the most basic, most fundamental object of mathematics. If you were to build a number system from scratch, it's natural you'd start with counting and therefore with integers. All the numbers we've dealt with so far have been expressed in terms of integers. Rational numbers are just numbers expressed in terms of the ratio of two integers. Algebraic numbers are the solutions to polynomials that have been constructed with integers. Seeing as integers are the building blocks of our mathematical world, it makes sense that all numbers could be expressed in terms of them. But in a shocking discovery, two of the most famous numbers were shown not to be related to integers by any of our algebraic toolkit, pi and e. It doesn't matter how we put them down, flip them or reverse them, they will just not be expressed by algebraic means. How crazy is that? We use these numbers so often, yet we can't construct them or even describe them in terms of our most fundamental mathematics. Numbers like this are called transcendental as they transcend algebra. They're like the wild animals of the number kingdom. We've managed to capture and tame the algebraic numbers, but the transcendentals, they continue to evade us. Only a very small portion of numbers have been proven to be transcendental. They are listed on one Wikipedia page. Bummer again. Maybe my number is not algebraic, but also maybe it is. What are the odds of my number being transcendental? We can literally build infinitely many polynomial equations with as many terms as we want, any of the infinitely many integer coefficients and any algebraic operations. This means that there are infinitely many polynomial equations and so infinitely many algebraic numbers. If we compare this to the small portion of proven transcendental numbers, it's pretty likely that my number will be algebraic, right? No. It's true that we can build infinitely many polynomial equations, but we are limited by the fact that their coefficients must be integers. And how many integers are there? Countably infinite. We can only have countably infinitely many polynomial equations and therefore countably infinitely many algebraic numbers. And how many real numbers are there? Uncountably infinite. So just as there are vastly more real numbers than rational numbers, there are vastly more real numbers than algebraic numbers. Do you know what this means? Most numbers are transcendental. Most numbers lie beyond integers and algebra. The numbers we deal with in daily life only represent a tiny infinitesimal dot of all the numbers that exist. Here's a nice image to show you which kinds of numbers fit where in relation to each other. So if most real numbers are transcendental, why is the Wikipedia list so short? Well, they are the only ones proven to be transcendental. It turns out that proving a number is transcendental is a very hard thing to do. This seems fitting given that they lie beyond the most natural ways we understand mathematics. I like how one mathematician put it, we can't find the hay in the haystack. The numbers we're used to working with are the needles and the tools we have are magnets. We haven't got a good tool for finding the hay. Before we get back to describing my number, I haven't given up yet. I want to say that it's pretty nuts that we came to these fascinating conclusions by analysing infinities. It's one of the most surprising and paradoxical areas of mathematics. If you'd like a fun and easy way to learn more about the nature of infinity, I've got a really good resource for you. Brilliant's course on infinity is the perfect introduction to this fascinating concept. In this course, you'll learn about how infinity pops up in unexpected places and how to deal with it when it does. You'll learn how to distinguish between countable and uncountable infinity by being guided through the mathematical proof so you can get a gut feel for them. And you'll discover infinities even bigger than the ones we talked about in this video. I wanted to get a deeper understanding of infinity, so I worked through the whole course and found insights that helped me develop my own intuition for it. It's a very rewarding feeling when you start to grasp a notoriously elusive subject. Brilliant focuses on captivating visuals and storytelling, 
Their approach centers around interactive hands-on learning. I honestly couldn't recommend it highly enough if your aim is to get a deep understanding of difficult concepts. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from how technology works to introduction to computer science to thinking mathematically. When you sign up, you can choose your interests and your level, so you get course recommendations tailored to you. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash upandatom or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get a 20% discount off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, back to describing my number. Where were we? Oh yeah, this number is, with extreme probability, transcendental. Bummer. Okay, fine, no need to despair. Maybe I can't write my number with algebra, but maybe I can still describe it, right? I mean, pi and e are transcendental and I can describe them. Pi is the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of a circle. E is the number in the function e to the power of x for which the function stays the same when you differentiate it. I'll settle for that, a description with words and symbols. I implore all the languages of humanity to describe my number. Guess what? All the languages of humanity are made of a finite number of symbols. Let's think about what a description is. A series of words and symbols arranged to convey meaning. There are a finite number of words in any given language and an infinite number of ways those words can be combined. But even if we considered the infinite number of combinations that can be created, you could, in theory, list them out. Each combination could be matched with a unique natural number. The set of possible descriptions of numbers is countably infinite. So even if we came up with infinitely many descriptions of numbers using all of the power of language, we'd still have an uncountable infinity of numbers left that we could not describe. It doesn't matter what mathematical tools you summon or invent, most numbers are and will always be indescribable. Thank you.